Good morning. Welcome to Delano United Methodist Church at Home. I'm Pastor Chad. It's great to have you joining us here for our November 1st edition, All Saints Day edition of Church at Home. And seeing that it is All Saints Day, we're going to have a special prayer time uh, led by Pastor Stina from the church here in a few moments to honor those who have died this year, uh, our friends and loved ones, and remember them uh, on this special occasion. Uh, it also is Communion Sunday, uh, so if you have some communion elements that are uh, available to you, you could gather those as well. We'll be doing those after the sermon, later on in the service. And of course, this is a video, so you can always pause things and go get stuff as you need them as well. But before we get to all of that, we have a few important announcements to make. And so we're going to kick it on over to the church and check in with Pastor Cena. This week, we want to give thanks for the many ways that you have been participating in the Plus One Challenge. I hope that you have enjoyed connecting with different church friends and found creative ways to stay connected in this season. I do want to remind you all that this is the home stretch for collecting your points. So if you have one of these tally cards or if you just want to send me an email, by November 8th, I ask that you give in your plus one points. I also have an electronic uh, link to do that as well in your chit chat. But make sure that you turn in your points by November 8th so that way we can collect them all and Hannah can determine how many points our congregation has gathered so that way she can get her guest stars lined up to award Chad and I our prizes from the Wheel of Mischief. So be sure to uh, cram in as many points as you can and I look forward to making Chad do lots of crazy things before this is all done. Merry Christmas to me. All right, now on to other more serious business. Uh, we also are in that season where we have been getting ready for the next year of ministry. And that means that we have been going through our annual giving drive. And I wanna thank you uh, for those of you who have continued to provide financial support of this community in a really challenging season. Thank you for your support. Thank you to all of you also who have managed to find a way to give online. Your online giving has really made a difference for our church in this season, and I am thankful for your participation in the online Vanco giving platform, so thank you. As we get ready for the 2021 budget, I do ask that everyone who is able to, uh, to fill in an annual giving card or the annual giving card online form, because your uh, proposed uh, giving for the next year, uh, giving us that kind of pledge in advance really does help inform us on providing a faithful prediction and analysis of what our 2021 ministry budget can be. So if you haven't given us a pledge card yet, make sure to send that in and we will be sharing at our November 15th annual meeting what our proposed 2021 budget is based on that projected annual giving amounts. Speaking of the annual meeting, I do want to remind everyone that this year our annual church conference will be on November 15th at 1 p.m. This year we are having it on Zoom. Now I realize that for some of you uh, doing that kind of digital participation is a challenge and so we are making sure to get all of our paperwork ready in advance so that way if you want to be able to review the budget or the leadership slate or any of our other annual meeting documents, we will have that ready by November 8th for you. We are working on also having it available for distribution. So if you want to receive an early copy of our annual meeting reports prior to the November 15th meeting, or just if you want it mailed to you because you don't think you'll be able to participate by Zoom, please contact the church office and we will make sure to get that to you uh, as soon as we are able. And that leads me to my final announcement, which is one of the reasons that we are having our annual meeting uh, by Zoom is because we want to provide good care for one another while COVID rates are increasing. And with the recent uh, rise in COVID rates, Bishop O has recommended that all churches within the Minnesota Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church move back to phase orange. And I have that link for the bishop's recommendation in our chit chat. So be sure to read that article if you want to learn more. But basically what Bishop O is recommending is that for this season, we try and do things online whenever possible. And if we gather in the building, we limit our in-person gatherings to 10 persons. And so that's kind of the basic guidelines that we're following in this season. And we know that uh, 
it means that things are going to look a little different in this uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas season. But I assure you, we have some really spectacular things planned and up our sleeves that we know are going to bring a lot of holiday joy to all of us. So uh, even though we're going to have to do things a little differently this year, we are going to make sure that we provide the best care we can for one another. And we know it is just one season in our lives and one day it, life will be different. So I thank you all for your patience. I thank you all for your love and I thank you all for your support. God bless, friends. On this All Saints Sunday, as we gather in prayer, we especially remember those whom we love who have died in this past year and across the years. And we find strength and courage from these words of grace said at every United Methodist funeral. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. 
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, on this All Saints Sunday, we bless your holy name and lift up all your servants who, having finished their course, now rest from their labors. Give us the grace to follow the example of their steadfastness and faithfulness through your honor and glory in Jesus Christ our Lord. And God, as we come to you in prayer this day, remembering those that we love and deeply miss, we take but a few moments to share the names that we remember in our hearts with you this day, remembering that in the absence, we remain connected to them through you, through the great cloud of heavenly witnesses, And we hold fast to the promise that Paul teaches us in Romans that nothing will ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so we share these names quietly with you right now, O God. We thank you, God, for hearing these prayers and continue to pray for your peace and your strength and your grace to be with all who mourn and to be with us in these tender days. Give us the strength to be renewed like those who mount on eagles' wings so that we may know of your strength and your power. We may remember that you are our good shepherd who will lead us even through the darkest valley And, oh God, this day, as we come praying for those that we love and have lost, we especially name those who have died this year that we have been praying for as a congregation. And this morning, we remember Dick Brannick, the brother-in-law of Joy Creek. Coral Bonneman, friend of Lynette Olson. Holly Robbins Calvin, cousin of Gary Helmick. Clark Christensen, friend of Lynette Olson. Kathy Cozy, friend of Annette Gilmer. Dan Davis uncle of Sarah Helmick. Mary Christine Hoffman, grandmother of Brent Schott. Glenn Janis, neighbor of Debbie Schindel. Joyce Jones, friend of Annette Gilmer. Mary Rose Johnson, friend and neighbor of Jill Lee. Dorothy, friend of Lynette Olson. Marlene Kundell, mother of Yvonne Dennis. Roland Keen, friend of the Howes family. Jean Locker, friend of Lynette. Olson. Amanda Larson, church member.
Lucy Lorsung, friend of Debbie Schindel. Casey McDonald, friend of Annette Gilmer. Kathy Meyer, sister of Lynn Tobeck. Christy Neal, cousin of Sarah Helmick. Jody Nelson, church member. Sandy Nelson, sister-in-law of Jody Nelson. Brooke Olson, Friend of Emily Hilbelink. Ryan Painshab, cousin of Kathy Workman. Roger Peterson, brother in law of Kathy Olson. Betty Randick, friend of Annette Gilmer. Otto Schindel, brother-in-law of Debbie Schindel. Andy Schindel, brother-in-law of Debbie Schindel. Leland Schrode, church member. June Sutton, friend of Delano United Methodist Church. Donald Tomic, friend of Preston and Annette Gilmer. James Riley Wallingford, father of Amy Wallingford. Chad Wandersee, friend of the Howes family. Glenn Weston, father of Deb DeBeer. Theodore Winstead, father of Cynthia Jacobson. And Janet Zace, sister of Sue Matzinger. Almighty and everlasting God, as we remember these saints that have been named aloud and those that are in our hearts, we remember that their lives continue on with you in your heavenly kingdom and that your love for us is never ending. We know that they have run their race and rest with you. And this day, O oh God, we give thanks for their legacy for their encouragement, and for the ways that they have shaped even everyone, every single one of us. May their lives of faith be a continued source of encouragement for us, that we 
may carry on that race with joy. And we may be a people who live out the prayer that Jesus taught us, a prayer that we remember and say together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Psalms. It's Psalm 3. Uh, we're uh, as you probably know, David is credited with having written many of the Psalms, and we've been going through his story over the past few weeks. Um, but this Psalm we thought would potentially fit really well for All Saints Sunday and also uh, connect in with our ongoing fall sermon series about King David. Uh, so here it is, Psalm 3. My foes are many, O God. So many are rising up against me and saying about me, there is no help for that one in God. You are my protector, my glory. You lift my head. I cry aloud and you answer from your holy mountain. I will not fear, though thousands are all around me. I lie down to rest and I sleep. I wake, for you uphold me. Arise, save us, O God. Judge the deeds of my foes. Put an end to the malice of the wicked. O God of salvation, bless your people. The word of God for the people of God. Today we take a moment to explore the Psalms as they fit into our journey of Israel becoming a nation and learning to live with kings. And before I get specifically into the, the Psalm for the day, I wanted to have us think back about earlier in the year. Many of you participated in my spring and summer Psalm a Day Challenge. And some of you even stuck it out through the end and read 150 psalms with me over the course of 150 days. And although I didn't get a chance to talk with all of you uh, who participated in this challenge, I was able to get a number of reports, some who shared what a delight and what a comfort it was to read the psalms, some who were honest and said, you know, it just got kind of boring and I lost interest in it. Uh, some who said, why are there so many unhappy Psalms and can't we just like skip over to the happy parts? I mean, come on, I get it already. Like another Psalm that's crying out. Can't we just get to the praise ones? You know, really there was the whole uh, gamut of responses of how we all encountered the Psalms, which I think is uh, revealing and important on what it means to be a uh, human, because we all have those responses, if we're honest, over the course of our lives. For many of you, you know that I pray the Psalms daily and that they're an important part of my life. And I hope that uh, maybe, maybe there's a few of you out there who, in doing the Psalm a Day Challenge, I got more interested in the Psalms and maybe you're continuing to pray them or maybe you're thinking that was a good one. I, maybe I'll maybe I'll give those Psalms a try again. Uh, and I wanted to share a little bit once more about why uh, praying the Psalms are so meaningful to me in my daily morning prayer. I will be honest that just like those responses that I had in the beginning, you know, sometimes when I pray the Psalms, they're a, they are a source of delight. Uh, sometimes I get bored. Sometimes it's like showing up for a bad day of exercising and I just, you know, you're just like, I don't feel like I'm getting out of this, anything out of this. Why did I even show up? And if I had to say uh, one of the things that I've learned in praying the Psalms or showing up in pr for prayer in general is that when we come to God in prayer, 
it's really pointless to even evaluate at all and try and say and try and assess how we think things are going because really we have no idea how God is working with us or through us and if you are bold enough to really commit yourself to daily prayer uh, whether it be praying the Psalms or just showing up every day in your time of personal prayer I know that um, for many of you, you will find that the periods where maybe you felt the le- like you were getting the least out of it in the long run actually became the periods where God did the most with you. So really trying to assess whether or not we're getting anything out of it or whether it fed me or whether I feel it meaningful or not are really pointless and uh actually stumbling blocks to assessing the value of praying the Psalms. So if, uh, if you were to indulge me and you're still with me, uh, let, I want us to kind of think a little more deeply, uh, about the work of the Psalms and how they can affect us over the course of our lives. And I I kind of liken it, uh, when it comes to why read the Psalms more than once, I kind of liken it to this rabbinical story uh, where an ardent theological student approached to his approached his teacher saying rabbi rabbi i have gone through the torah five times already and was proud at how many times he had read these scriptures and not missing a breath the rabbi replies to him but have you allowed the torah to go all the way through you and I think that's the, the journey that we take when we are praying the Psalms. It's not how many times we've prayed the Psalms. It's not me boasting to you that I have prayed the Psalms daily for, oh boy, uh, about a dozen years. The point is, is that it's whether or not the Psalms are praying through me, right? Whether those are becoming moments in my life where God has just the smallest place to have a foothold to open my life up with grace and renewal and encouragement. That's what I think we're hoping for and searching for in learning about and praying the Psalms, that they can pray us. So if you're new to the Psalms, or maybe if you want to learn a little bit more about the Psalms because you have uh, prayed the Psalm a Day Challenge with me, I wanted to share a little bit about an overview of the Psalms because they are a large book of the Bible and they are a collection of 150 prayers of the Hebrew people. They were actually gathered over generations and prayed uh, over four generations until being compiled into their form that we know of today. The, the, the arrangement, the structure of the 150 weren't actually edited together until the, until they, uh, after the Hebrew exile, until the people had come back to Jerusalem and were rebuilding the temple. That is when the formal book of the Psalms that we know of really took its shape that we know. However, those prayers were regularly prayed an important liturgy of the people, uh, both in their homes and collectively. And the prayers of the Psalms were especially important to the Israelites during their time of exile, when they were no longer in Jerusalem or Israel, when they were taken captive. These Psalms uh, became the heartbeat of who they were as a people. It became like a virtual temple, a place for the people to be swept up in God's glory and beauty, a place for them to sing the songs of God and retell their salvation story through metaphor and poetry and lift them up together uh, and connect them as a greater people at a time when they were all apart. Now, in the book of the Psalms, David's name actually appears as a superscription in 73 of the Psalms. 
And that's why in particular we're talking about them today because of their connection to David. Although there are a number of anonymous authors and other authors, uh, even a few attributed to Solomon. And although we don't know how many of those 73 David actually wrote himself, regardless, they speak of David's condition. And we know that he was a poet. We know that he was involved in providing that kind of poetic prayer and music. And so uh, whether or not he wrote all 73 doesn't really matter, but it shows us that, you know, half of the Psalms are in that time period and that spirit of David's reign as king of Israel. If we were to look at the, the 150 Psalms as they are arranged, uh, we can take Psalms one and two and look at them as kind of the theological framework of the Psalms. And they summarize uh, a lot of the theology of the Psalms, a lot of the points of the Psalms, uh, and give you kind of something to hang all the rest of the Psalms on. Psalm 1, uh, of course, it's very fitting that it is the first Psalm because it is the one that gives us this important imagery about happy are those um, who do these things that are good. And it likens them to a tree planted by living water producing fruit and we have this image from the beginning of the psalms of the garden of eden that sense of living the good life is like becoming a tree that's always blooming always producing good fruit and always fed by living water a genuine paradise emerging uh, because of the pursuit and the attainment of wisdom and contentment. And then we have with Psalm 2 uh, uh, a framework that brings in the longing that the Hebrew people had for a king or a mighty ruler or a savior, whatever title you want to use there. And we have a, a lament uh, emerge where there is a great sense of pain and cry and despair over the brokenness of human leadership that exists and a genuine desire for a wise ruler to lead the way forward. And in the midst of all of that despair and that hope, there is a faithful decree that God will rule over all. Now, so together with these two introductory Psalms, Psalm 1 and 2, remind us basically Happy are those who delight in God's instruction, and happy are those who orient their lives to God. And we learn from this, these introductory psalms that the goal of life will not be self-fulfillment, but a desire to be so connected with God as the ruler of our lives, that our own lives are freely producing fruit without effort. And that we are able to be a source of contentment and justice and peace, regardless of what happens around us. Now, those are the first two Psalms, the framework, an important roadmap for us to remember. Because when we get to the very end of the Psalms, the last five Psalms end with complete praise. But guess what? Psalms 3 through 144, the vast majority of the Psalms are kind of a roadmap of the human psyche of what happens in the midst of everything else. And we have the Psalms divided into several sub books and that really subdivision is not that important. But we have Psalms that call up for cries of deliverance and help. We have Psalms of confession about what is wrong in the world, about what's wrong in ourselves. We have confession, we have psalms of doubt, we have psalms of despair, we have psalms that speak toward the historical uh, moments in, hi in Israel's history, uh, speaking of the exile, speaking of the uh, the exodus, the exile, you name it, it's in there, a lot about David's lives, and yet in the base of all of this stuff, we get this resounding, uh, swirling image in the midst of chaos that the psalmists teach us that to be happy, the thing that was pointed to in the beginning psalms, does not mean 
to live without struggle or opposition. But to be happy or to be content involves a commitment to genuinely going through our struggles, to be truthful about ourselves and about our world, and to have a bold tenacity that God will be faithful and lead us through all things, not to avoid the things we don't want, but to go through all things. And that is why the psalmist is able to end with the final five psalms of Alleluia. Because the psalmists know that in spite of whatever we may face, or maybe because of everything that we face, everything will be well. Alleluia. Now, that's a pretty bold claim, and I hate to have you leap into that journey of Alleluia too fast, but that is kind of a brief overview of the compilation of the 150 Psalms and the arc they take. What I'd like to do now is go specifically then to the Psalm that we have chosen for this morning, which is Psalm 3, the beginning of really the, the Psalms that uh, are part are the meat of the Psalms. And uh, today's Psalm, the superscription in most of your Bibles will say a Psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. And that's why we chose this Psalm this morning, because we have been journeying through Israel's story as they became a kingdom, as they moved from being a tribal nomadic people into a nation state. And we have been following the journey of Israel under Saul and the journey of Israel under David. And today we get to the point in, in uh, David's journey where he has been king for a while. And if you were to read the corresponding part of why he has to flee from his son Absalom, I would point you to the book of 2 Samuel, chapters 15 through 18. And that is a portion in David's kingship where, yes, Absalom, his son, mounts a rebellion. And... Um, well, if you want the backstory on that, I invite you to read that part of 2 Samuel. And I will warn you as parents, uh, do, I do not encourage you reading that part of the Bible with anyone under 16. Uh, because this, uh, this portion of the Bible is really suitable for mature audiences only. Um, it is full of very... Uh, violent content, uh, sexually explicit content, uh, political intrigue, rebellion, uh, things that aren't suitable for a family show. Uh, and they get kind of messy really fast. Uh, the Bible is uh, much more raw than most of us give it credit for. And that part of the Bible especially uh, really reveals both the heights and the depths of human nature. So this psalm uh, reflects a very uh, challenging time in David's kingship and a time where he was at a place of immense vulnerability because he was on the run. And if you uh, went back a few sermons with me, you know that David was familiar to being on the run. He had been on the run when Saul was king and Saul was chasing him. And so once again, David is on the run, this time because his son uh, ousted him from power and he's running for his life. And that is the setting for our psalm, our prayer for today. And it's no wonder then that this psalm in particular is a cry for deliverance, right? Basically, David says, help, God, help. There are people actually trying to kill me. Help, rise up, protect me. And although David's uh, journey is unique, I think it's important for us to take a sense of not just historically isolating this psalm as a song uh, David once cried out when he was in trouble, because the psalms are trying to get into our own lives. And so the question for us is, what does this mean for us, right? How is this prayer praying through me? If I am not in David's actual position, if, if I'm in a place uh, of safety or whatever it is, uh, well, I think, I think it's pretty straightforward. This psalm is a cry for deliverance. 
And the cry for deliverance is a common theme in our Psalms. It's so common that it is really why most of you who reported discomfort reported discomfort with me because you were uncomfortable with how often the psalmist asked for help, how often they found themselves in bad positions, and how often they needed God to intercede. And you know what? It's true. This is an uncomfortable theme for most good Methodists. After all, as Methodists, we pride ourselves on being committed to doing all the good we can. We are a people who do no harm. And in our zealous pursuit of sanctification, we often default in our Methodist theology into a false sense of believing that God only helps those who help themselves. And this is where Psalm 3 and other cries of deliverance are so important for us. Because these kinds of prayers pierce in and rip apart that kind of falsely crafted narrative that makes us believe that God will only help those who help themselves. This kind of prayer is at the heart of humility and of grace, reminding us that God is there to intercede. God is here to be of assistance, of deliverance. This kind of psalm reminds us that God is more than a happily nodding parent present at a piano recital. But God is a powerful father, capable of rescuing, forgiving, healing, and helping us out of the most gravest of circumstances. David knew that. And that is why Psalm 3 is so important to us today. Because Psalm 3 reminds us of the images of God we often forget. These very important truths that God will rise, that God will be a shield, that God will be a refuge, that God will sustain, that God will uphold. This prayer acknowledges that yes, there may be many foes that rise up against you, but God will always rise up. God will always rise up. Eugene Peterson once wrote, at the heart of it, prayer is the language of a people who are in trouble and know it and believe it or hope that God can get them out. And he also wrote this, to put it another way, I only pray when I'm in trouble, but I'm in trouble all the time. Friends, this morning, I urge and encourage you to take time and give yourself over to God in prayer and ask God to rise up for you. What is it that you need deliverance from? What is it that you long for our community, our nation, and our world to be delivered from. It is time for us to be bold, to give to God openly and honestly these cries of deliverance in our prayers, in the sure assurance and faith in knowing that God will rise up. God will be a shield. God will be a refuge. God will sustain and God will uphold. And it is in the humility and knowing that God may not act in the ways that we suggest, but God will be faithful. God will walk with us even in the darkest valleys. God will not promise to spare us from our struggles, but God will be there through all of it because God is greater. God is stronger. God is the Alpha and the Omega, and nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Psalms invite us into a poetic, heartfelt, understanding, intimate knowledge of God that goes beyond analytical answers. They go to this kind of ground level of being, and they do it through an artistic 
way. And so instead of having me go on and on about the cries of deliverance that we have for God, I'd like to close our prayer time this morning, our reflections on the Psalms, by listening to a piece of music that I think embodies Psalm 3's cry for deliverance, cry for God to rise up and to be our shield and our shelter. We shared it earlier in the spring and it was recorded by Christian Nielsen for the O oh Shelter Me song composed while we were staying at home. I invite you as the song plays to take a moment and to be present with God, honest about whatever is going on in your life and humble enough to know that God will rise up for you.
As we celebrate communion at home this morning, I invite you to either take the element that maybe you picked up at church, or find some simple bread and juice or drink to bring to the table. If you're not ready, that's okay. Just pause this video, go get what you need, and then come back and join us. In the United Methodist tradition, we give thanks and celebrate that everybody is welcome to gather around God's table. God is always inviting us into a relationship. God is always reaching out to nourish us, to feed us, to show us that God is our great provider and our sustainer and our redeemer. And so it is with this great joy that we prepare to set this table together. And I remind you that the Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Miriam and Moses, God of Joshua and Deborah, God of Ruth and David, God of the priests and the prophets, God of Mary and Joseph, God of the apostles and the martyrs, God of our mothers and our fathers, God of our children to all generations. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus the Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made us with a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And so we remember, on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread that was at his table, and he gave thanks to you, Almighty God. And when he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, he said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took a cup, and again he gave thanks to you, Almighty God. And when he gave it to his disciples, he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from this, Remember me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, 
and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with all of your saints, especially those whom we name before you in our hearts. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, strengthen us, too, to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. By our spirit, make us one with each other, one with Christ, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus the Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Friends, together we have set the table. And in these following moments, as music is shared, I invite you to take time in your own home to celebrate communion, to eat of whatever you have, and to drink from whatever you have. And remember that God is here with you now, and that in the sharing, we are reconnected to one another, and we are reconnected with the great cloud of witnesses that goes before us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, that's about it from uh, from the porch for this week. Um, I wanted to say a brief word, though, about one other thing that's happening that's probably on a lot of our minds, and that's the election on Tuesday. Um, you know, however it turns out, whatever your political leanings are, um, I would just remind us to stay humble. 
Uh, whether things go your way or not on Tuesday does not dictate how things are going to manifest in the future. So let's remember, God is in control of this. We're playing our small part, and on Tuesday we'll play that part. Uh, but how things ultimately turn out is up to God and not to us. And so let's stay humble. And uh, also, it probably would do good to remind us that Jesus asked us to love our enemies. <laughs> no. And though it may be extreme to um, call our political rivals our enemies, nevertheless, it's a good opportunity for us to practice one of the most difficult things that Jesus asked us to do. That is to stay compassionate and stay loving toward our neighbors, even when we disagree with them terribly. So, um, however things turn out on Tuesday, whether you're happy or sad Tuesday night, I pray that... Uh, we can all be caring and loving for one another and staying humble about what's going to happen and continue to just do the good thing in the moment. Um, we'll get through this. Stay strong. And may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you and all of your families.